Hello everybody, it's been a very long while since I've done a Q&A and today we're filming in my car because I am out of town for my semester break and I don't really have a comfortable space for me to film in and since a lot of YouTubers tend to do a lot of talking heads and vlogs and basically talking heads in their cars, I figured I'd do the same. There must be some kind of charm to it. Alright, so I'll begin with the questions on Facebook because earlier on Friday I asked you guys to send in your questions and we only have one question on Facebook, the rest came in on Instagram. So Owen asks, Hi my friend, I got a GoTalks V860 flash and I wonder if syncing the speed with the camera, let's say 1600, really gives me 1600 speed or just 250. Now by speed, I suppose you're meaning shutter speed, so the exposure time. And when it comes to flashes and their exposure times, it does work a little trickier because uh, there's a limited range of shutter speeds that work with flashes. So in this case, if say 1600, I'm not sure if you can actually dial in the exposure time on the flashes. Uh, from what I know for speed lights such as the Gotox you're talking about, you can only set a output fraction on the speed light itself. So in this case, if you have high speed sync enabled, you would be able to take a photo with the flash firing with a 1600th of a second exposure. If you do not have high speed synchronization enabled, then you're limited to the maximum flash sync speed of your camera. Now, different cameras have different maximum flash sync speeds. On the ATD, it's 1 250th of a second. On the 5D, it's 1 200th of a second. On the 6D, it's only uh, 180th of a second. Now, not to say you can't take a picture at that shutter speed, but if you do not have high speed sync enabled and you were to take a picture at that speed, you will get severe banding. So to answer your question, if you do have high speed sync enabled and active, you would be able to take a perfectly fine picture at 1600th of a second exposure speeds with the flash firing. Okay, that's it for Facebook. Let's move on to Instagram. What's a good start into color grading pictures slash video for beginners? Hmm, the exposure just changed. Now that's a very interesting question because when you mention color grading, most of the time, the industry always uses that term for video and motion picture only. You always see it in films. But for some reason, nobody ever uses that term for stills. I have no idea why. I would love to know. Maybe you can use it for stills, but for some reason, nobody uses it. And what looks good for stills and motion picture, as defined by the industry, is, is also pretty different. And I can see why, because motion picture, you have to apply a grade that looks good across a whole lot of frames and when you take a still you only perfect that one still anyway to go back to what you're saying color grading is the process where you actually introduce a look and a personalized touch to the image so that always comes after color correction color correction is when you balance out the white balance you make sure the exposure is correct so to answer your question so a good start would be to color correct but you can't really say that's a good start because that's in a way a prerequisite with the exception that you're trying to get a look you want in camera so for example if you're trying to get a very warm look so you shoot it with a very warm white balance it doesn't make sense to correct that back to neutrals back in post and then warming it back up again so that's the exception in terms of the start for the actual creative process of color grading i usually start with context. It's understanding what the still is about, what the story is about, if it's a scene or a shot. For a video, you have to understand the meaning behind it. If it's a still, you have to take into context what the content is about. For example, if it's a happy photo of a couple, it doesn't make sense to slap on a very high contrast grade to it with a lot of crushed blacks and like super high contrast with like green shadows and like magenta highlights that looks like a horror film. So you have to take into account what the frame is about. And from there, I'll try to decide it on how I want the overall tone to look like. Do I want it to look very warm, very cool? Is there any color tint I would like to apply to it? And you did specifically mention how to get into this color grading process for beginners. Now for me, when I look at beginner work, the biggest thing that screams beginner is they do an extreme case of what's called split toning. You basically apply a color, which is usually a teal color, something bluish, into the shadows, and then you apply the complementary color of that into the highlights. Now that is one of the common formulas of doing it, but people push it to such extremes that the image just starts to fall apart. My biggest advice to get into it would be try to be subtle, as subtle as possible. Um, people would try to push their grades very far 
so they get these really heavily saturated colors just so people would notice that you've done a grade. For me, it should be something very fine and subtle, which actually enhances the image and it doesn't draw too much attention to the actual grade itself. When the actual grade itself becomes distracting, then that becomes a problem. And pay extra attention to skin tones. When people get started in the color grading process, for me, skin tones are the most important part of the frame when you apply color grading to it. That's where your subject usually is. That's where everybody is looking at. So if the skin tones are not on point, then it starts to look very unnatural. How old are you? I was born on 27th June 1997, which makes me 20. Quick maths! How's life? Well, as some of you may already know, I am a film student, so being a YouTuber as well, to create regular content on YouTube, you might have noticed I went MIA for quite a few weeks. For those of you who have been students before or who currently are students, you, you probably understand the lack of time resources. But I'll always be trying my best to create regular content on this channel. Regular quality content. How did you start photography? Well, I started on camera phones actually. Back when I was a kid, I would always take my dad's camera phone and start taking pictures with it. And that's how my passion in photography first sparked. My first proper camera, I, I don't think you can call it a proper camera. It was a point and shoot. It didn't even have manual mode, but it was a compact camera. It was a Nikon Coolpix something. I can't exactly remember the model number. I'll probably cut it in here somewhere when I edit this or if I ever find out. But that was my first camera camera. My first proper DSLR was a Canon 550D that I got when I was 15. So that's how I started photography, all the way back from uh, those 0.3 megapixel camera phones. Where do you recommend shopping for camera gears in Kuala Lumpur? Well, I usually do a search online and just buy from wherever store that sells it for the cheapest. But I do have a go-to. Uh, my go-to is this shop called ACCE Camera Store. It's on the sixth floor of Berjaya Times Square in Bukit Bintang. So if you want to go camera shopping in Malaysia, I have no affiliations with the owner of the shop, by the way. I just do a bunch of my shopping there because I'm Asian and I just buy from wherever sells it for the cheapest. Okay, this is a long overdue question. It's posted three weeks ago. I like how you talk to the camera. Do you use a teleprompter? Do you speak one sentence at a time and then edit them together to make it look that you are continuously talking? Do you practice a lot before the real video? Good question. I don't have a teleprompter because I can't afford one yet. Those things are expensive. If it's a short and simple video about a topic that I'm very comfortable with, I usually go freestyle on it. Well, there is a lot of cutting involved, as you can notice from the various jump cuts. So yes, I do say a few sentences at a time until I screw up and then I'll just cut out the parts where I screwed up and either start over again. Sometimes I have to repeat a sentence five or six times because speech is hard. <laughs> if it's a longer video with a lot of key points, then I would usually type it out in a Word document and then look at my notes on a laptop. I'll just keep glancing away in between cuts. That's especially for the case where it's a video about a particular product and there's a lot to memorize, such as product specifications, then I will usually type those out and refer to my printed notes or on a laptop. The main purpose of the typed out script is to make sure that I don't miss out anything when I'm freestyling that I do want to include in the video that's important. So I don't want to cut the roll and be like, oh, I forgot to include in the video that very key important thing about that one product that I'm very much supposed to talk about. So that's the main purpose of the script. So that's pretty much it for the questions this time round. If you have any more questions that you would like me to answer in upcoming videos, just leave them in the comment section of this video or actually any video. But use the hashtag AskZ so I know that it's a question that you would want me to answer in a Q&A video. Now before I cut the roll here today, I would also like to tell you guys about my kit page. So I've set up a kit profile. So kit is a website that allows creators like me to list out gear that I use for particular tasks. For example, I have a kit called my YouTube filming kit, which includes all the gear that I use to create my YouTube videos. So if you're ever wondering what gear do I use for particular tasks, you can always find that out over at my kit page. And you can also suggest kits for me to create that you would like to know. I hope that made sense.
So that's pretty much it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.